Uh, so, good afternoon, everyone. I would like to thank the organizers for giving me this opportunity. Uh, Professor Katabira mentioned that they were experts talking, but I have to disclaim this. I'm not an expert in NCDs and um, aging. I'm actually learning, and uh, th this is why actually I have this senior fellowship that is sponsored by EDCTP, where I'm actually trying to learn more about uh, HIV and aging. So, uh, the establishment and scale-up of solid and sustainable HIV programs in sub-Saharan Africa has led to a reduction in uh, morbidity and mortality. And uh, this one, together with the achievement of the 90-90-90 goals, uh, is going to result uh, in a decrease in, in opportunistic infections, surfacing of non-communicable diseases uh, in the HIV population, especially those on long-term art and older, and also uh, increased longevity, leading to uh, an increasing number of uh, elderly HIV, of people aging with uh, HIV. Uh, so as much as, of course, we have still to be worried about people who present late and uh, other issues like accelerated art start, we also need to start thinking about how to manage people who survive long and then age with HIV. Uh, people living with HIV generally have a three times fold risk of non-communicable diseases. Uh, and this includes multiple NCDs, uh, hypertension, diabetes, renal disease, uh, lung disease, cardiovascular, cancer, and bone abnormalities, uh, and liver failure. And there are several reasons for this. One is chronic inflammation, which I will describe a bit more in detail in the next slide. Um, then sequelae of opportunistic infection. For example, you can imagine the damage that tuberculosis can leave to lungs. Uh, Long-term exposure to art, again, think about xenophobia and uh, um, renal disease. Uh, increased risk now associated with aging, with the fact that we are seeing older people with HIV. And this actually sums up to traditional factors uh, like age, gender, family history, urbanization, overweight and obesity, and physical inactivity. And some people also in our region may not be aware that some of these are risk factors. For example, if you think about weight, weight in our setting is really perceived as health and wealth. So we also we need to go back and start the education programs to address traditional factors, not just HIV-related factors. So, this, is, uh, this slide summarizes the contribution, or try to depict the contribution of uh, um, chronic inflammation to the increase of uh, uh, cardiovascular diseases. So people with uh, HIV, uh, okay, people with HIV uh, also are on antiretroviral treatment. And so what happens is that uh, at the level of the lymph nodes, because of HIV infection, we have a, re a reduction of immunity and immune depression. We also have a disruption of the mucosas, and particularly the gut one. And that actually increases uh, the exposure to different pathogens. Um, including HIV itself. And then both HIV and that antiretroviral treatment uh, uh, actually can cause uh, uh, liver dysfunction. So all of these uh, proximal effects, a level of uh, the monocyte and the macrophages, and there is uh, uh, activation of these cells, and at the same time there is also an alteration of the coagulation. And uh, this may result in uh, vascular uh, dysfunction, atherosclerosis, and uh, um, tissues necrosis. And eventually, the distal effect of all of that uh, is uh, multimorbidity and aging. So this slide shows comorbidity by age in the VAX cohort in the US. And uh, uh, the lightest uh, green shows a population under 40. And the, 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 the darkest green shows population over 60. If you look at any comorbidity, there is a steady increase that goes together with, with age. And that is true for majority of the NCDs that uh, were studied in this cohort, hypertension, diabetes, vascular disease, pulmonary disease, renal disease. The trend changes just a bit with liver disease, where uh, all the population is actually 
associated at some point, with, there is a decrease actually in the prevalence of uh, liver disease. Uh, now um, I'm going to show uh, a meta-analysis from low and middle income countries where they actually look at risk factors for non-communicable diseases and they calculated pooled estimates for those. I'm not going to read all of them, but for example, hypertension, it was found at 21.2%. Any level of dyslipidemia is 72.5%. If you combine overweight and obese, 27.3%, and depression at 24.4%. I now wanted to show you some uh, of the data we have locally, just to give you like a flavor of what we know, at least for uh, urban Uganda. So I have two sets here. Yeah, there are two different cohorts. The one on the left is a cohort of adults that were on antiretroviral treatment for, uh, uh, I'm sorry, for 10 years, at the time they were enrolled in the cohort, and they were on any line, so first, second, or third. The median age time of enrollment was 45, um, and we found 3.2% of these individuals having diabetes, 20.9% having hypertension, alcohol use 75.2, and tobacco use 23.4. Now, on the slide, on the, sorry, on the right side of the slide, instead, uh, we have another court of adults, uh, of which I will talk a bit more later also, that uh, um, were enrolled in this cohort because being classified as uh, elderly, which for the Uganda cutoff is 60 years. And so they were enrolled, if they were more than 60 years, in uh, our uh, elderly cohort. The median age was 64. They were on treatment for a median time of 14 years. And uh, we found uh, the following condition. Overweight and obese, 43.5%. Diabetes at 14%. Hypertension at 50%. Chronic kidney disease at 46.2%. And also we found that decreased bone density in 72.7%. So as much as this is worrying, I also think that uh, this is an opportunity for integration of care. And sometimes lessons from integration of HIV care uh, with other diseases uh, can also be, then be translated uh, to the general population. So, HIV care programs usually are better staffed and better funded than the other program. And in many countries, they are actually the first functional large-scale uh, chronic care programs. And so, to me, they offer an ideal setting to screen and follow up NCDs. And uh, WHO already recommends the integration of care for a series of conditions like tuberculosis uh, or, for example, for antenatal care. And so I think it is time, time that we really plan to, um, uh, to also introduce, introduce in integration of care for NCDs because, as I demo just demonstrated in the previous slide, at least in urban settings, these, uh, these conditions are really prevalent. Additionally, uh, I think that they provide a setting really to, to, um, uh, to kind of uh, uh, pilot uh, which tool to use, uh, how to use it, who should uh, screen for, uh, uh, for NCDs, should be the doctor, should be the nurse, and then all these lessons can really be adapted uh, to uh, national programs uh, also for the general population. So, I just wanted to show you this slide. This is an article that was uh, published from South Africa, and uh, it kind of supports what I was uh, saying in the previous slide. So what happens is that um, generally it's thought that because uh, people living with HIV have, uh, has, uh, have regular encounters with the health system, uh, it is more likely that uh, NCDs and other conditions are diagnosed as compared to actually neg HIV negative individuals. So in this study, uh, you can see on your left, that is the, uh, is the shows the uh, median blood pressure in uh, different categories, HIV negative, uh, HIV positive not on art, HIV positive on art and those suppressed. And if you look at the HIV negative, which is the first dot, and the HIV, uh, infected uh, with undetectable viral load, you see that uh, the um, HIV uh, 
infected individual actually had a better control blood pressure as compared to HIV negative. And this study also showed that not just these diseases are controlled better, but that awareness of having <coughs> some of these conditions is much higher in the HIV, uh, in people living with HIV than in people living without HIV, because again, they go at least uh, three, four times in a year in a hospital to pick the drugs, and so someone is at a minimum measuring their blood pressure. Uh, while HIV, an infected individual, they will just go to the hospital when they're very sick. I'm, not, I'm now moving away from NCDs and looking more at aging. So why studying aging in Africa, which is actually the region with the world's youngest population? So it is actually projected that uh, um, there is going to be really an increase in the older population in Africa more than any other continent. Uh, and uh, um, actually the growth in the number of older Africans uh, will exceed 200% in, of growth in the next 30 years. So uh, we talked up to now about uh, uh, non-communicable diseases. We said how uh, people with HIV are at higher risk of NCDs, and that is increasing with age. So therefore, we are also going to see an increase in NCDs in the older population. But now, I would like to actually focus with uh, what are diseases that are really age-related uh, age uh, and not the conventional NCDs we always refer to. Uh, before I go to that, uh, I wanted also to show you that despite uh, um, there is a, this projected growth into the population, countries are likely not to be ready. So this is a study from Uganda where they actually look at uh, the WHO building blocks for geriatric friendly care services. So some things are in place. If you look at the columns on the right side, you, you will find that there is some level of geriatric care service, uh, um, there is some equipment, uh, and there is somehow uh, some uh, electronic or medical record that can uh, actually capture data on this population. But worrisome, there is absolutely zero when we go to leadership and governance, zero when we look at finances, and only 1.7% uh, if you look at human resources uh, for geriatric care. We really don't have uh, any trained personnel. So here we go with geriatric related diseases. These are commonly uh, called geriatric syndromes. These are health conditions that cross organ systems and disciplines in the older population. They are usually multifactorial, they share risk factors, and also uh, pathophysiology. And, uh, Although the geriatricians have, um, you know, uh, used that and now embraced this term geriatric syndrome, this, com this concept uh, has remained poorly defined. I would like to show you uh, what is a bit the pathway of these geriatric syndromes. So we said that they share risk factors. For example, age, cognitive impairment, functional impairment, reduced mobility, uh, sorry, mobility. And this contributes to what uh, are known as geriatric syndromes, such as incontinence, falls, delirium, functional decline, and all of these increase frailty. I'm going to say a word later about frailty. And frailty itself can actually go back and, and make all these other geriatric syndromes become worse. So the bad news is that once you start uh, experiencing geriatric syndrome, especially frailty, then uh, the na outcomes are really negative, and so we go towards dependence, disability, hospitalization, and finally death. So what is frailty? Again, there is no standardized definition of frailty. Most often it's defined as a syndrome of physiological decline in late life, and it is characterized by marked vulnerability to adverse health outcomes. So in other words, frail older people are less able to adapt uh, or to recoup after, having, after stressors, uh, such acute illness and trauma. And uh, frailty is accelerated in people living with HIV, so this is another bad news. And uh, HIV is an independent risk of uh, a factor for frailty, 
with the prevalence ranging from 5 to 30 percent, depending on the age where you look at it. When I say it is accelerated, it means that it starts earlier as compared to HIV-negative individuals, and it also progresses faster. On the right, I try to simplify what is called the cycle of frailty. This cycle can actually st uh, start at any point. So for example, for the bottom, an elderly person may start uh, by you know, a decrease in physical activity. This may cause decrease in appetite, which eventually turns uh, on in being uh, malnourished or at least malnutrition. This also causes a re reduction of your muscle mass, uh, sarcopenia. And uh, this results again in uh, uh, decreased reserve. And when you have decreased reserve, of course, uh, you will start actually reducing again your physical activity. So it's a cycle, but in, in, you know, in few words, it's a spiral because it gets worse and worse. Again, uh, there are some uh, uh, hypothesized pathways for frailty. Uh, and again, the exposure is, uh, um, you know, in addition to what HIV negative individual would have, there is also HIV infection in art. And so these go and influence some underlying factors. At molecular level, I just give some example. The gut disruption we already talked about, or mitochondrial dysfunction. Comorbidities, we said already that, they, they, that people living with HIV, uh, of course they have opportunistic infection, but also, uh, also have an increase in NCDs. There are also environmental, em, environmental factors that we need to take in account, nutrition, uh, physical activity, but also, for example, substantial abuse. So all of these factors trigger some pathways, uh, uh, inflammation, immune activation, uh, neuroendocrine de uh, dysregulation, renin angiotensin and aldosterone system alteration. And these pathways, they also interact with each other. Uh, so these pathway, pathways actually then end up causing some pathologies, for example, insulin resistance, anorexia, and so on. Uh, these translate in clinical findings, and that is, these findings, I'll go through them in the following slide, because there are some of the findings that are actually used to measure frailty, and then again, this results in negative outcomes. So, there are mainly two approaches to measure frailty. Uh, actually, there are very many, but these are the two main schools. And then also out of these approaches, there are different variants of tools and questionnaires. So one is what is called the phenotype model. And the phenotype model really look at these clinical features I was mentioning before. One is unintentional weight loss, five kilograms of more than 5% in 12 months, weakness measured by grip strength, exhaustion uh, that is self-reporting, slowness that is measured using gait speed, and low activity that is also self-reported. And uh, in presence of two measurements, a person is defined frail, three or more, uh, sorry, pre-frail, and three or more frail. Uh, the weakness of this method is that it could miss uh, some frail individual. And then there is the frailty index. The, the concept of the frailty index is actually <coughs> A, a concept of accumulation of clinical deficits. For example, loss of hearing. There are 40 items, and uh, uh, the level of freighty is determined by the percentage uh, of presence of these deficits. Uh, the advantage they, they, of this method is that you really uh, have a gradient because you have 40 items you are assessing, but again, there is no standardization. And uh, um, while there, I, I mentioned that there are these two schools, the present consensus is that probably you should use both. Phenotype model can uh, work better at the beginning to assess the, the level, the phenotype, really the level of frailty of a person, but per full, for follow-up, uh, sometimes <coughs> frailty index is more indicated. African studies are scarce. They are done in different countries, different age groups. And so, for example, in South Africa, it was found <coughs> They found frailty at 19% with a median age of 42. Tanzania, 7% in people aged 60 and above. Uganda, 19% in people uh, aged 44 years. And uh, some of the factors as associated with frailty in Sub-Saharan Africa are age, female gender, low education, living alone, uh, 
low BMI, depression, low CD4 count. Some are similar, some are different from other settings. They are, so they need to be really investigated in our settings. Again, sorry. Um, I just wanted to show data from our cohort. If you, re if you remember, <coughs> I presented uh, um, some data on uh, a cohort of people uh, um, that is uh, um, of people with six of age 16 and above, uh, which is funded by EDCTP. And uh, these are all people uh, more than 60, and we do screening for NCDs, geriatric syndromes, disability, mental illness, quality of life. The screening procedure are nurse-led and are interpreted by a physician. These are our, this is what we measure. I'm not going to go through this list. This is just for you to appreciate that they are really long visit and we really screen for a lot of conditions. And so see, this is our preliminary data. It's not published, but I thought I was going still to share <coughs> with you what, we, what are the con most common conditions in uh, our elderly population. We have depression at 10%. Looking at frailty, we have 45.8% of the patients pre-frail, 9% frail. When we look at sarcopenia, we have probable sarcopenia in 1.8, confirmed in 6%, and CVI in 2.6. Uh, the short uh, physical battery measure the functionality of the lower limbs, uh, and we find that 28.2% uh, has moderate function, and 6.4% they actually have low function. So we have only uh, 65 with the preserved function of the lower limbs. We found cognitive impairment in a level at 72.8, history of falls in 41.2, and then uh, urinary stress incontinence 16.6, urgent incontinence 38.1, and we found 17.2% at risk of malnutrition and 2.6% uh, malnourished. I'm actually going to conclude here. So overall in this presentation, what we wanted to demonstrate is, uh, and show you that is that HIV infection is associated um, with an increase in NCDs and also accelerated aging due to multiple uh, factors such as chronic inflammation and also long-term exposure to art. So I think geriatric medicine is fairly a new concept in Africa and we need to train more healthcare workers. Now, um, two years ago, when we had to start this, this project, we actually had to send our study physician abroad uh, because we really didn't know, I also didn't know, I have a background in infectious diseases. And so we really need to send abroad uh, the uh, study physician to be able to uh, understand how to use some of these screening tools. And, uh, and so now we are training other people to do that. Uh, so it's really long, it's going to be a long way to try to train people. The other thing is that I think we need to develop and adapt simplified tools. I showed that uh, the tools we use, first of all, there are very many. Some procedures are, are extremely long. One of our visits lasts from two to three hours. This is absolutely not uh, scalable anywhere in our setting. And uh, we also think that some tools we use may be wrong, we may use wrong cutoffs. If you see the, if you remember the slide with the uh, uh, cognitive impairment, a uh, 70.8 percent is really too high. And talking with experts in mental illness, uh, they really told us that we really should be should see much, much lower levels. So either the tool is not um, fine for our setting, or maybe the cutoff is not fine due, due to probably cultural educational reasons. So we are. In the, the, in the process, for example, for that particular tool, we are using the MOCA to try to see and compare it with another tool. And then finally, I think it is still important. We are still at the point where just describing what we are seeing in our population because we need to plan. What are we going to do with people that are aging with HIV, with people that are going to have several NCDs and geriatric syndromes? Some, many of these conditions are preventable or you can actually stop the progression. Sometimes with intervention that are not so expensive, but is actually about changing lifestyle, for example. And so I think it's really important that this work is done so that we can plan for a better future for the people living and aging with HIV in Uganda. Thank you.